Very good. So now we'll get even more specific into uh, some topics involving Midwest ISO uh, and that evolving market and changing market uh, for here in the Ameren territory. So our last speaker is Ron Rickman, Senior Consultant at Customized Energy Solutions. With over 20 years of experience in the industry, Ron provides regulatory coverage and consulting to clients in the Midwest with an interest in generation asset management and trading. Before joining Customized Energy Solutions, he was Director of Commercial Markets with Ameren Energy Marketing, which provides retail and wholesale power to customers throughout the Midwest. Please welcome Ron. Thanks. Thank you. Well, uh, we're going to take a deep dive, so you might want to get a little more coffee. <laughs> but I will tell you, I'll make it a little bit easier. I am pretty much a fast talker, and I also brought pictures. So that always makes it a little bit easier. Uh, what I'm going to talk about today is really the evolving market of, of MISO. And, and as, as was initially brought up, it, it stands for the Midwest uh, Independent System Operator but they've actually just changed their, market, or their name to Mid-Continent Independent System Operator. And again, showing a little bit of their, their evolution, the idea is that they're going to have some new members coming on, and we'll talk a little bit about that. So um, let me start off with and really kind of take you all the way back to early 2000, before MISO came about. And really, what, what was going on during that time frame was you had a lot of utilities, municipalities, and cooperatives they were handling the electric needs for their customers within their area. So they had a local balancing area, if you will, and they were providing the power needs for those customers. So they were making sure that every hour that, and every minute, if you will, that the load that needed them or the demand, they had the supply that was going to match them. So that was something that was very important for them, of course, and it was a reliability <laughs> aspect. They also needed to make sure that when the load moved, that they could regulate that generation around that. So there was a regulation service that was also provided. They were also concerned that if the generation was to come offline, they needed to make sure that they had reserves, if you will, or a contingency plan to make sure that they could have uh, that resource you know, and other resources come in and take the place of that resource that might have dropped off, which is contingency reserves. Not only that, but they also had to be concerned about do we have adequate enough resources or capacity and making sure, and uh, the chairman spoke to this a little bit as well, making sure not only do you have something for today, but for tomorrow, the next five years. And many um, of those uh, utilities and such were doing a lot of those activities of looking forward and making sure they had adequate enough resources. And then the underlying of all of this was the transmission, making sure that you could get that generation to the load when you needed to. So these were all being done by these local balancing areas, and they said, well, an idea, if you will, was kind of proffered, is there a way that if these local balancing areas could work together, could there be a value of doing that? A value of, let's say, an integrated system. So in the example I was mentioning where you, know, you have generation trying to meet the, the demand minute by minute, so they're having to move that generation to the, uh, the needs of the, of the system. If they're having to move up in that five minutes, and there's another local balancing area right nearby that's going to move down, is there a way that the two could work together and have less of, of, of a need, if you will, almost even net out some of the obligations? Or if there was contingency reserves, right, in case that unit went down, is there a way they could kind of share some of those reserves? So that's really a, kind of the aspect that kind of started to, to pull this together. Was there a value proposition uh, to a value of an integrated system? So really, MISA was looking to uh, be developed to kind of bring that process about. Now, I won't get into all the details around this because there's a lot that went on during that time frame. So I'm going to kind of skip over and give, kind of give a general overview. But over, over that time period, around 2000 to 2005, these 20 balancing or 20 plus local balancing areas, so these munis, these co-ops and utilities, were joining together to form uh, the Mid-Continent Independent System Operator. Uh, the first aspect of it was the transmission. So they were getting the transmission together to where they can move uh, electricity more freely amongst their members. In 2005, they added an energy market on top of that, the ability then to access cost-effective resources in each other's areas. And then in 2009, they added the, the contingency reserves and the regulation. Sometimes you'll hear me refer to that as ancillary services. Because initially, the energy is the, the, is the key, if you will, and then everything builds around that. So energy minute by minute, then the regulation or mi regulating uh, back and forth, 
and the contingency, so the regulation and contingency are kind of considered ancillary services. All, um, that was added in 2009. And then in 2011, they looked at, hey, let's, let's start to add the other pieces. And the other last two pieces were resource adequacy, again, making sure they have adequate resources in the future, and then also making sure that they have transmission planning so that they look at a, a forward time frame as well to make sure that that generation can meet the needs of the, the local areas. Now, this market has gotten quite large over time. I've kind of put up some of the numbers up there. I mean, there's 362 market participants that participate in this overall market. There's about 132,000 megawatts of generation within that footprint. A peak load of around 98,000 megawatts, 49,000 miles of transmission. And MISO actually acts as, if you will, a clearinghouse. They're a nonprofit organization, but they act as a clearinghouse uh, to making sure that all these transactions come and go, if you will. And in over a year, over $18 billion, $18.4 billion in charges go through um, their hands, if you will, through this marketplace. So it's quite large. Um, but then the key was, are these um, utilities and these munis and these co-ops that were saying, hey, let's get together, are they getting the value that they once you know, believed? And MISO has done a study on this. They, they, they do this every year. And this last year, 2012, they calculated that this value proposition was bringing about 1.9 billion to 2.4 billion in regional benefits. And really the idea around that was that they were you know, more efficiently using the existing transmission system and generation assets and reducing the new need for new assets down the road. And so membership is kind of driven, if you will, to some degree to that value proposition. And membership also is voluntary. So when somebody is looking to uh, come into the, uh, uh, into the MISO, they're looking at that value proposition saying, hey, does it make sense for us to do that? And they have a choice uh, to some degree on which um, RTO they may go to. And that's actually what happened in Illinois. I think Chairman kind of spoke to us a little bit that Illinois is in a unique situation in, in that ComEd to the north decided to go with PJM. Ameren to the south decided to go with MISO. Uh, they had their different reasons for doing that, but each one of those markets evolve a little differently based on their membership. So PGM moved in a, in a certain direction, MISO moved in a different direction, if you will. And so their energy markets, their ancillary markets, that regulation contingency I spoke of, the resource adequacy and how they handle that are different. And uh, market participants can move some energy and capacity across that seam, but it is a little bit difficult because there are some different barriers between those two and how they evolved. And they have a little bit different approach to transmission planning. But the reason I kind of touched on a little bit on the voluntary membership was also to point out that you could have somebody who's of a large size want to join your RTO or MISO. And that's what's happening here. We have Entergy that's planning on joining around uh, in December. Entergy actually spans over four different states, they, in Arkansas, Mississippi, Louisiana, and, and parts of Texas and uh, brings with it quite a bit of, um, of load. It brings uh, uh, close to 40,000 and a little bit more on the generation side. I think it's a little bit in excess of the 40,000. So they bring a little more generation than load. They're gonna bring a lot of transmission as well, around 18,000 miles of high voltage transmission lines. And um, the generation mix there is a lot different as well. They're more of a gas oil mix. And uh, here in the MISO currently, we're more of a coal mix. So. And it kind of goes a little bit to the, the point that was being brought forward earlier was that hey, we don't really know how some of those generation mixes may be in the future. Even today, we see disparity depending on the different regions you're in. Um, FERC and state decisions for this, uh, for energy joining is expected around mid-September. And uh, the one key point though, and it's a little bit hard to see on this, but what will happen is Entergy by joining will make it now where, where uh, MISO will stretch from Canada all the way down to the Gulf Coast. So this has really made it a large piece of the Midwest that you'll have generation being redispatched, if you will, and you also have these ancillary services and resource adequacy and transmission being taken care of. I won't spend a whole lot of time on this slide, but I wanna, I wanna stress a couple of things, which is really on a, on a market basis like this where MISO is developed, it's built on the, the, the forefront of reliability, and that's making sure that, that everything that keeps the lights on, really, that's essentially what the, what the idea is, right? Just to make sure that they have a reliable operating system. So that means you need to make sure the markets around it behave in such a way that they are complementing that. You want to have market prices that set the right incentives. You want to make sure you're getting a cost-effective delivery of electric power. 
And you also want to make sure that if you have transmission limitations that aren't allowing you to really seek and get all of those benefits out of it, that you do the proper planning to see how you're going to manage that. And really, I think it kind of all centers around the right mix of resources at the right locations, you know, with sufficient transmission to reliably operate the system. And so I think that's really kind of the key, the, the right mix of resources, the right locations, and then getting that transmission to go through. Now we're going to dive a little deep, so buckle in here. <laughs> No, but what we're going to talk a little bit about is that adequate resources. This is the, these are the two items, that the transmission and this piece is what I mentioned has really just come about in the, in the last couple of years and is really getting a lot of attention. Having adequate resources in the future is one of those foundational items, especially when you're thinking about reliability. You know, MISA right now requires, and they're looking at it from an annual basis. Now, their annual is a little different. It's not a calendar year. They're looking at it from what's called a planning year perspective. So they're looking from June 2013 all the way to May 2014. And so really their focus is going to be on this summer coming up. And they require that the, uh, the load goes out and procures enough generation uh, or enough resources, if you will, to cover the system peak of MISO, so their, their obligation to that system peak, plus a small amount of reserve margin on top of that. Because again, that reserve margin is to make sure that if something happens, that they still have some backup of resources to handle any uh, occurrence that might happen. Now the question is, that reserve margin, how do you calculate that? What's, what's the right number to say how much you need? Now this really gets into a kind of a probability analysis, if you will, and I'm not going to go too deep into it. But what the standard is that they've looked at is said, what we'd be, we'd be happy with, if you will, if we only had one day in every 10 years that we would have a loss of load event, meaning that during a system peak that we would have the inability to deliver power. We'd only have, want that to happen one day in every 10 years. So that's a pretty high reliability standard. And they said, okay, so that's going to help us to determine exactly how many extra megawatts or extra generation that we want to cover. So um, this is now required for an annual auction that they're putting on MISO does to make sure everybody has procured those resources to be able to cover that uh, peak plus that reserve margin. However, the resources where they're located is real important. Okay, so now you see a bunch of different colors up here and some numbers and, and, what, I, and what I'm going to break down for you here is where the location of that resource is is going to be an important aspect of whether it can be delivered to the load. So let's just say for argument's sake, all the generation resided in North Dakota and all the load was in Illinois. Well, there's only a certain amount of transmission lines that can get it from point A to B. And so it, it, you might have a reliability aspect of if you can't get all that generation across. And there's some natural boundaries there as well, right? You've got the Mississippi River, for example. How many transmission lines go across that? So what MISA did said, well, let's take a step back. Let's look at these different zones and let's try to determine where we have, if you will, a group of these local balancing areas that naturally kind of fit together and where are some of those state boundaries. And so and some of those uh, natural boundaries. So Mississippi River becomes one of those natural. Sometimes the state boundaries become that boundary as well. And so they created seven different zones. And they said, okay, out of these seven different zones, we want to make sure we have enough local resources in those zones to cover the load needs or the demand needs in those areas. Now, the auction's also set up so that if you don't have enough capability to bring that in, that the prices should rise in that zone. It kind of makes sense, right, that if you had a, a zone that was not able to bring in enough generation to cover this one in ten event, that you would want to have the prices kind of show a little bit of a reflection of that. Now, if all generation can reach everywhere, the price will be the same in every zone. And that's actually what occurred here in this recent auction that MISO um, had for the planning year of, you know, so starting in June of 2013 to May 2014, uh, they finished up their auction, and the auction price ended up at $1.05 a megawatt day, or about $0.03 cents a kilowatt month. And it was the same price for every zone. So there was no um, aspect of anybody having any trouble delivering within the market. Now, PGM, though, has a very different design, but they did hold on to one key component, because both MISO and PGM both uh, report, if you will, uh, to the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. And what I mean report, their tariffs are, uh, uh, Federal Energy Regulatory Commission watches over their tariff, if you will, and ministers uh, any changes and helps them to understand how they need to develop, if you will, in the future. One of the key components that both of them have is the locational aspect of where those generation resources. Because again, I think it falls under the aspect of reliability. 
And so it really touches, too, that deliverability of a resource is really important. So let's go into that for just a quick minute. Reliability and deliverability matters, and deliverability kind of goes to the point that I think was brought up a little bit about how important transmission is, and that MISO has a transmission expansion plan that they put together every year. So they bring together not only the stakeholders, they bring in the transmission owners, and they also bring in now staff commission as well, uh, commission staff, I mean, to come in as well and, and, and provide some input. And so what they're trying to do is determine exactly what transmission needs they need for the future to provide for a reliable system, as well as making sure that they can get that generation to the load areas that they need to. I'm not going to go into each one of those projects, but overall the, the MTEP 12, which was just the most recent one that was approved by the board, we're looking at about $1.5 billion worth of transmission that's going to be built. Now that's over the next five or so years, so it's not just going to be done in one year. And there's a lot of things that that, uh, that, that might change over that period of time as well, because there's definitely uh, aspects of those utilities and such going to their commissions and making sure that those fit in within the needs of the state. And there's other aspects that they'll need to go through. But this is from a planning process of trying to say this is the things that we'll possibly need over the next several years. Additionally, there's these multi-value projects. Now, this happened a couple of years ago, and it was the idea that we have so much wind in the Midwest ISO, or the Mid-Continent, let me check that, uh, MISO. Um, and in MISO, in Iowa and in, in some areas of, of Minnesota, um, you have quite a bit of wind. Matter of fact, if the wind blew to the fullest extent so those wind farms could produce at their maximum amount, it would be around 12,000 megawatts. That's about equivalent to 10 nuclear units. Now, we're talking about a lot of power. There's a problem. All of that power isn't sitting next to that load. So we've got a problem of trying to get that generation, if you will, to the areas that it needs to. And so these multi-value projects came out to the tune of about $5 billion over the next, it could be as far as 10 to 15 years, depending on, on you know, when some of these get done. Hopefully a little bit more in the closer term. But this is a lot of transmission, very high voltage transmission lines that will move some of those megawatts if, uh, from those uh, uh, Midwest uh, wind farms into the areas of Illinois, for example, as well into Indiana. And that's what it kind of means to Illinois. Illinois is going to be a part of that. Matter of fact, of that $5 billion that's going to, uh, to, to uh, be spent, if you will, on, on some of these transmission projects, one in, uh, $1.2 billion of that is going to be done in the Illinois area. And we're looking at that over a 2013-2017 period, looking at possibly the, the construction to begin around 2014. It's still going to go through FERC, uh, you know, had FERC review, and as well, the uh, Illinois Commerce Commission will also review that. And the cost allocation will be through some of the MISO charges. Now, that's kind of why I brought some of these things to your attention is because as retail suppliers that are going to be looking to provide power for various customers, a couple of these items are things that they have to keep their eye on. They have to keep their eye on what are those costs going to be in the future. They don't know exactly what they're going to be, but they have kind of a forecast, and they're always having to true it up based on the actual charge that comes in. So this is something definitely that, uh, if you will, retail suppliers have to keep an eye on. And I think it was important also to be able to bring it up to you so you have an idea of some of the things that are happening. Just to kind of wrap up, and hopefully uh, the coffee got you through it, <laughs> and I spoke fast enough. Um, re reliability is at its core. We really want to make sure MISO does to, that not only that they have the adequate resources, but they're doing proper transmission planning and construction on the high voltage lines. We want to make sure that the markets really help uh, uh, the overall uh, market and that it's not hurting it. Really getting the energy, the ancillary services, making sure that, and the ancillary against that regulation and, and that contingency, and making sure they have adequate resources in the future. And, and the oversight. Uh, you know, you have a federal agency called the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission that's over, you know, watching over what MICE is doing. Uh, the states are getting very involved. The Illinois Commerce Commission, I was just talking to the chairman earlier about how involved they're having to get that this isn't something they used to have to do. Now they're very involved in that process because it affects the state of Illinois. And also market participants, uh, they want to make sure that they have a level playing field and make sure that, you know, things are done, you know, in, a, in the best way possible. So MICE is trying to take all those different varied interests and really trying to put forth, if you will, a market that continues to evolve for their customers' needs. So uh, I think that was, yep, that's all I had.